14 months after his wife's sentencing, Eli met the stepdaughter he hadn't known existed. This happened in mid-April, when business slowed. The winter sports crowd gone with the melted snow, the summer season months away. So he reserved his finest room for her. He aired it himself, changing the linen on the queen-size bed, stocking the fireplace, the last operable one outside of the parlor, with wood he'd split expressly for this purpose, dusting the bureau and wardrobe, even washing the long window overlooking Mariner's meager downtown. To the east, he could see Lake Superior, two blocks away through the gaps in the buildings. The stepdaughter, Marlene, lived in Chicago. He worried she'd find his inn hokey, but nothing could be done about that. After three generations and 85 years without closing, not for the 1932 flood or the more routine blizzards and ice storms, the Mariner Inn existed outside of history and the fads that had absorbed so much of its now-defunct competition. At least he liked to think so. Marlene arrived on a Thursday as he served afternoon tea to the inn's lone guest, an academic couple from the Twin Cities. The bell jangled, then stopped abruptly when a draft slammed shut the door, rattling the windows. Eli paused, listening to the interlopers' clopping footsteps on the hardwood floor. The steps rang out, slow and even, and by the time he'd served the tea and Kringla, she stood in the doorway. She was tall and striking, like her mother, with spiky auburn hair. Freckles dotted her cheeks and the upturned nose that twitched as she looked around. Younger than he'd expected, mid-twenties, she had the air of someone at home under any circumstances. She dropped her duffel bag and shrugged off a backpack, taking her time unbuttoning her form-fitting gray trench coat before entering the room. You must be Eli, she said ignoring the inquisitive eyes of the middle-aged couple who seemed to sense that, at last, something interesting might happen. He bowed to the couple and said, Please excuse me, before taking Marlene's outstretched hand. Her grip was firm, confident, though she had trouble maintaining eye contact. When she did look at him, he felt dizzy. She had her mother's eyes, both their size verging on being too large for her face and her cool blue color. They didn't speak while he led her upstairs to the room, and he remained silent in the doorway while she walked the perimeter, like a cat, before taking the bags from him and heaving them onto the bed. The springs creaked, and she turned to him. This is a good mattress, right? I can't sleep on one that isn't firm. In her voice, he heard the same insistent tone she'd had when she'd first called, five weeks earlier. She's in prison? What did she do? No shock, no utterances of denial, or feigned disbelief. 